It's now my pleasure to introduce my younger brother, Mike Milne. Um, Mike, uh, after spending a little time in Australia when we first migrated here, moved to Canada where he worked for Canadian Pacific in operational management roles for 24 years before coming back to Australia, working with Lloyds for uh, a couple of years um, and then um, opted for the easier life and joined the um, South Australian government uh, where for uh, a significant number of years he was a senior policy advisor to ministers and um, agencies on aviation matters. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the last seven years he's been secretary of the uh, South Australian Aviation Museum and um, again looking for the easy life is now its vice president. Um, in between times when he's had a little spare time he's written a couple of books, um, two volume history of the, um, uh, of the, uh, what? So the, the royal something, is it royal? Yeah, all right. He can tell you when he gets there, I'm deaf. So. Um, all of this gives him um, a very considerable perspective on um, aviation generally, but uh, in his capacity as a, in the museum, of course, he's been interested in the um, appearance of the um, flight of the Vicky's Vimy, which had in fact landed in Darwin yesterday, 100 years ago. So without further ado, Mike will tell you some more of the story about the, the Vicky's Vimy. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you very much for having me yet again. This is the second time I've supped at your table, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, the last time I was here, Lainey Anderson spoke, and uh, she told you the epic flight story pretty much from the birth of the Smith brothers right through to Ross Smith and... Uh, sorry, is that better? right through until uh, Ross Smith and Jim Bennett's deaths in the Viking crash at Brooklands in 1922. Uh, she left the Vimy in Adelaide to where it had flown on the 23rd of March, 1923. Uh, sorry, 1920. So I'll assume you're all full bottle on all, all that history. And uh, what I plan to do is sort of close off the story with what happened to the Vimy next. <coughs> So, remember it was left in Adelaide and, and after Easter in 1920, the four of them, that's uh, Ross and Keith Smith and Jim Bennett and Wally Shears, flew it back to Point Cook where it remained for some time in the custody of the... Uh, hang on, let me just see if this works. There we go. <clears throat> It remained for some time in the custody of the Australian Air Corps and then the RAAF when it was formed in March 1921. So that's uh, yet another centenary coming up. But the, the Vimy was really on its last legs. Remember, Vickers refused Ross's request to take the aircraft to Adelaide because they knew it could pack up at any time. They'd already had a, a horrendous time getting the aeroplane down from Darwin to Melbourne and then to Adelaide. So Ross really pulled a fast one when he persuaded Billy Hughes to let him take the flight um, to Adelaide as soon as Vickers gifted the aircraft to the Commonwealth. And he very nearly ended up with egg on his face because uh, there were more major engine problems which delayed the return to Melbourne. The Australian Air Corps put, the, uh, put on a show of World War I aircraft in Melbourne in mid-1920, uh, and that included the Vimy, and Senior Warrant Officer Jim Bennett was actually the, uh, the tour guide. Um, he was shortly to become Lieutenant Bennett when his and Wally Shear's very belated honorary commissions came through uh, later that year in September. But then in April 1922, 
The aircraft was dismantled and moved to Sydney for exhibition at the Royal Show, this time with Lieutenant Wally Shears being the exhibition guide. And it was during the show, I, I call him Shears, I've always called him, it's actually the family told me it actually should be Shires. So if you ever refer to him, for goodness sake, say Shires and don't follow my example. Anyway, it was during the show that Wally would have heard of the death of Ross and Jim Bennett at Brooklyn's in that Viking crash on the 23rd of April. But straight after the Royal Show, the aircraft was rushed back to Melbourne for the opening of the new War Memorial Museum in Melbourne's Exhibition Building on Anzac Day in 1922. There it is on display. It remained there until that museum was closed in January 1925, and that was due to a fire risk. Apparently, the, those old Melbourne exhibition buildings were all built of timber, and it was just a horrendous fire risk to very valuable artefacts. But Sydney, anyway, as you can imagine, had long sought to be the location of the War Memorial Museum anyway, and no doubt it was very quick to capitalise on, on the opportunity. So the Vimy was duly relocated to Sydney in the, uh, what then became the, uh, the Sydney Exhibition Building. That closed in 1935, ten years afterwards, and thereafter, the Vimy was placed in storage until it was moved to the newly opened Australian War Memorial in Canberra in 1941. There it is just before the opening. And here's, I think, yes, there's a picture of it on display in the War Memorial. And there's another one. <clears throat> but by 1953... The War Memorial in Canberra was being swamped with the inflow of World War II artefacts and it really needed to make space. Noel Flanagan, the AWM's director, that's him on the right there, he quickly set his sights on the Vimy because the Vimy had actually never seen war service and probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. And the same applied to Smithy's Southern Cross, which was also displayed there at the time. So Flanagan wrote to the Department of Civil, Avi Civil Aviation in August 1953 to ask if it was interested in acquiring the two aircraft. The DCA initially considered displaying them in new terminals that were being built in Sydney and Melbourne, with the Southern Cross being earmarked for Sydney. And other options were discussed, like dismantling the aircraft and spreading bits and pieces around the country in technical museums. And even uh, there was brief discussion of uh, building a new National Aviation Museum in Canberra. But that was all too hard or it cost money, so the DCA in September advised the ABM, thanks but no thanks. So things went quiet for a couple of years until in June 1955, uh, when on instructions from the chief of the air staff, the Vimy was quietly dismantled and moved into storage at Canberra Airport. It leaked out, of course, and there was an national, immediate national outcry. Sir Hudson Fish wrote to the Prime Minister. and uh, No, he didn't write to the Prime Minister. Sorry, he wrote to the Minister for State for Air and Civil Aviation in Menzies' government and demanded that it be restated immediately in the War Memorial. And Sir Keith Smith, who sadly by then only had a couple of months to live, he wrote to the Prime Minister to express his shock and concern and he opposed its relocation anywhere outside the capital and particularly to what he called the partially derelict Parafield Airport. <laughs> now, the reference to Parafield Airport I think must have been a reference to the Royal Air Club of South Australia's lobbying efforts to get the aircraft to Adelaide. The club, of course, was based at Parafield. So Nobby Buckley, who was then the club's president, there's Nobby, and his, that's in his Guinea Airways uniform, he formed a committee called the Sir Ross and Sir Keith Smith War Memorial Committee, and it was to, lay, uh, to lobby and raise money for the proposal. Nobby was its inaugural chairman in 1956. The Lord Mayor was president, the governor was patron, and a range of Adelaide leading lights, including South, Australia, South Australian Senator Keith Lort, were members. 
So poor old Nobby soon proved to be far too lightweight amongst that mob, and he was moved aside for Group Captain Reg Reckner, DFC. Uh, Reckner was a Citizen Air Force member of the Commonwealth Air Board, State Manager for Australian Air Airlines, and incidentally, he became our museum's initial patron. The club earlier had written to the Premier as early as July 1955 to ask his support. But canny old Tom Playford, the old cherry farmer, he didn't want a bar of that. Tom just replied to the question that hadn't been asked, saying the state government didn't have sufficient building space to accommodate the aircraft. He didn't volunteer any other help. So anyway, the committee set out to raise money and commissioned David Michelmore, and I think his son is one of your members. Is David here today? No? I met him at the, the last lunch. Uh, but David Michelmore was to design a memorial building, and they set a target of £30,000 and quickly moved towards it with Vickers, Vimy, uh, sorry, with Vickers donating £5,000 and pledging another 5000 if it proved necessary. Um, that's the original architect's drawing of the proposed building, so you can see it didn't change a lot. But things had moved on in Canberra as, as well. Canberra uh, Cabinet had rejected the idea of a National Aviation Museum, surprise, surprise, but approved unconditional offers of the Vimy to the South Australian Government and the Southern Cross to the Brisbane City Council. By then it was obvious in Canberra that Premier Tom was less than enthusiastic about the idea. A letter was, had been drafted to him saying, I'm directed to offer this aircraft to you unconditionally. I would appreciate your views at an early date. It was never sent, no doubt to avoid the embarrassment of him refusing. So it wasn't until September 1956 that Menzies wrote the Premier a much more equivocal letter. He proposed that the Vimy be transported to Adelaide to be housed in the memorial to be built by public subscription at Adelaide Airport and maintained by the DCA. That's that building. And far from offering the, uh, asking the Premier to accept the offer of an unconditional gift, instead he asked the Premier to confirm that the South Australian government regards the proposal as satisfactory. Here's a picture of Sir Tom with Bob Menzies a couple of years later when they opened the Elizabeth uh, Shopping Centre. But, but how could Tom say no? The proposal wasn't going to cost the South Australian government a, a zack then or into the future. The unconditional gift to the South Australian government was dead and buried and Playford had little choice other than to reply, the proposed, the proposed arrangements are satisfactory to the South Australian government. I don't think you could get much more lukewarm than that. The arrangement left a lot of loose ends, though. While the Commonwealth had committed to making the land at the newly opened Adelaide Airport available and to the DCA maintaining the building, nothing whatever had been said about who would maintain the aircraft. And Mr Flanagan, you remember the, the uh, uh, director of the Australian War Memorial, since he was now absolved of all responsibility for the aircraft, he cheerfully provided advice that the entity responsible for maintaining the building, naturally, the unfortunate DCA, should be responsible for the relic inside it. The Prime Minister's office wrote to the Minister of Civil, Avi Civil Aviation, whose department was responsible for the building, in November 1957, to tell him the Minister for Air was custodian of the aircraft, and presumably that was because the, the aircraft was still then in a hangar in, at Fairburn in Canberra, so it was responsible of the, F, uh, to the RAAF, uh, for which the Minister was responsible. But the Minister for Air scrawled wrong on his copy of the letter and promptly ignored it. Anyway, the, the DCA had duly provided the land at Adelaide Airport the memorial was to be built on, and construction started in April 1957. There was a bit of bickering over responsibility for drainage and preparation, land preparation and so on, but by and large the, the project went well. And a committee had raised £29,000, all of which was spent on construction costs except for 300 that was set aside for the opening ceremony. 
and it was the RAF's job, the RAAF's job, to transport the dismantled aircraft from Fairbourne, Fairbairn to the memorial and, and reassemble it. So there's the... Uh, it came on two semis. There's one of them with a the fuselage being loaded in Canberra. And the convoy left Canberra on the 1st of November 1957. But GEAOU's tribulations were not over, however. The semi, not this one, the other one, carrying the upper wing, outer lower wings, engine nacelles and props, but not the engines, fortunately, caught fire just outside of Keith on the 3rd of November. The driver quickly got the trailer uncoupled and he and the RAF personnel from the other vehicles frantically set about firefighting with the extinguishers they carried and the Keith fire truck was there within 10 minutes but it was far too little, far too late, sadly. And you can imagine the, the, the RAF personnel must have been beside themselves. The Keith, the Keith firemen said that they'd been most secretive about the whole affair. The men appeared to be very upset about the loss of the Vimy wing. They'd actually lost much more than that. A warrant officer who appeared to be in charge was particularly upset. As well he might be. No doubt he was picturing the headlines and the wrath of his masters in Canberra. Anyway, the cause of the fire was never confirmed, although a court of inquiry was immediately convened. But popular su suspicion has always been that the driver of the semi had thrown a cigarette butt out of the window. The good news, however, was that the entire fuselage, tail surfaces, lower inner wings were intact and it was immediately decided to restore the rest. Here's another one taken before the reassembly showing the, those engines in front of the Eagle 8 engines that actually uh, escaped the fire. Now, the opening had been planned for the 15th of December, so that had to be postponed, of course, and a hive of activity began behind the scenes. It really was a rough job. The, uh, the Department of Aircraft Production at Parafield did it, and the Minister for Air's thoroughly disgraceful instructions to the Department of Aircraft Production were, one, I'll read them because they, <laughs> they're hard to believe, the airplane is to be restored so that externally it appears sufficiently like the original to be accepted by such as persons other than those with special knowledge. The airplane is not required to be restored in such a manner that its original structural strength is returned. Lastly, most outrageously, the strength requirement to be observed is that the airplane should maintain its structure without da danger of collapse and injury to spectators. In other words, the restoration had to be good enough to fool the average punter and not fall apart in front of them. And I hasten to say that's not how we restore aeroplanes at our museum. John Dowie was, you know, the, um, the sculptures adjacent to the memorial. He was running a bit behind with the sculpture and only the delay caused by the restoration allowed him to finish it before the opening. So there he is. Uh, the, the memorial was finally open to a huge crowd with the restored aircraft in it by Air, Air Marshal Sir Richard Williams on the 27th of April 1958. Sir Richard had been Ross's number one squadron commander in Palestine during the war. Some 40,000 people attended, including Wally Shires, and there was a flyby of three cameras and two meteors. And, of course, Wally was the last survivor by then. And uh, I might say that the leading Canberra in that flyby is now on display at the Aviation Museum. Sir Richard, after formally unveiling the memorial, then handed the keys of the building to Premier Playford. But in a classic demonstration of past the parcel, Sir Thomas immediately handed them on to Sir Philip McBride, the Minister for Defence, who was representing the Prime Minister, so Tom was still determined not to be seen as the custodian of the aircraft. But looking at early photos of the memorial, there's, that's one soon after its opening, you have to wonder what on earth they were thinking of, what sort of glue they were sniffing when they designed it with northeast, northwest glass-facing frontages. 
particularly as the building wasn't even air-conditioned for some years. One can only assume that they actually... Oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Can only assume that uh, they got it back to front and it should have been around the other way. By September 1964, that's what, only six years after the opening, Sir Keith's widow, Lady Smith, was formally complaining to the DCA's region, regional director about the deterioration of the exhibit. The DCA never took its custodianship of the aircraft and its responsibility for its restoration very seriously. This result, are you going to gong me? Yeah, I'm going to gong you. <laughs> I've got, got about two minutes. I've got five minutes. You've got five minutes. So sit down. <laughs> so. I have never been able to control him. <laughs> I might say at the beginning I was going to make a lot of jokes about, uh, similar to the Smith brothers, about older siblings being in the shadow of their younger brothers. But... <laughs> Will you just get on with it, please? Given his very gracious introduction, I decided not to. All right, quickly, quickly. Uh, Lady Smith was thoroughly disgusted with the state of the exhibits. And this resulted in a flurry of Commonwealth correspondence about costs of remedial works. But it wasn't until the 67-68 budget that money was finally set aside for, for minor restorations. And it wasn't until late 81 that a major five-month $10,000 restoration of the aircraft was carried out. The works included replacement items missing the previous, in the previous restorations, plus some heavy maintenance. And in spite of the recognition nearly 20 years before the damage the ultraviolet exposure was doing, virtually nothing had been done about it other than installation of some reflective window foil. Until then. Norm Pointing, who did the, uh, the five-month restoration, lobbied for building modifications, but it wasn't until, unbelievably, 85, 86, that money was finally allocated for these screens that were completed in January 1987. Their cost, plus other minor building treatments and fire protection measured, uh, cost 261000 By then, the DCA had become the DOTC and was chafing badly about its enforced custodianship of the memorial and the aircraft and this huge expense. One minute. <laughs> they even tried to lease the building to Birdwood Mill Museum in exchange for the maintenance costs. And this was probably prompted by the impending transfer of the airport to the newly formed Federal Airports Corporation and the absolute can of worms the ownership issues still represented. Nobody knew, actually, who owned the building built by public subscription, for instance. But anyway, the Birdwood Mill didn't have a bar of it, so the custodianship of the building and the aircraft passed to the FAC when it took over the airport in 1988. And precious little, done was little, precious little was done for either the building or the aircraft after that until the Commonwealth solved all its responsibilities with the sale of the long-term lease of the airport to Adelaide Airport Limited in May 1998. And this is finally the wind-up. So, one minute. You keep saying one minute. <laughs> the memorial, including the building, statues, aircraft and associate artefacts, was made subject to an agreement between the Commonwealth and AAL. This agreement made AAL directly and explicitly responsible for the management, operation and maintenance of the building and all its contents for the first time. And in making this agreement, the Commonwealth asserted ownership of the whole caboodle so that it could be in a position to impose those obligations on its lessees. In spite of all that, this is interesting, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> The issue of who owns the aircraft still periodically arises in the press. It's often asserted that the aircraft was gifted to the people of South Australia and that the state owns the aircraft. I, I hope I've convinced you that it doesn't. As to the future, the construction of the new terminal and the movement of the centre of activity of the airport away from the present building have obviously made the location of the Vimy less than ideal. AAL recognised that and has planned its relocation to a magnificent new pavilion that they've just finished construction of, which is part of its uh, new terminal expansion. But as an interim measure, it did some 
temporary works, which I'll quickly show you. So that's going to take us through till 1921, when the whole kit and caboodle... 2021? 2021. But I have to say, the aircraft itself is looking better now than I've ever seen it, and that Adelaide Airport Limited has done a magnificent job of looking after it with twice yearly art lab inspections and so on. But ta-da, that's it. That's the new building. Sorry to take so long. No, I, I, I think with an address like that, we can probably forgive him and don't go away because you're going to have to answer questions. The first of which is from me. Um, wouldn't it have been easier if you know, just moved the aeroplane to the South Australian Aviation Museum, it seemed to me to be a sensible custodian. Well, we thought that was quite a good idea, and uh, I was still in the government at that time, and uh, actually we got the approval of both state and federal uh, ministers to do, do just that. But unfortunately there was a change in managing director at the airport. The previous managing director was very keen to get rid of it, it was uh, in a parking lot in the way of the, uh, the new terminal expansion. Um, but the new managing director, actually to his credit, has a very good sense of history and he saw the value of keeping the thing at Adelaide Airport where, after all, more than 8 million people a year are going to see it versus a quarter of a million at, at our museum. Right. Now, questions? Peter Neal, always quick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm not sure we should be thanking you for a wonderful presentation or for an elegant lesson on how to manage siblings, but <laughs> <laughs> either Long way, practice. thank you very much. Um, I watched the documentary on Sunday night uh, on SBS, a uh, wonderful documentary, um, and people like David Seaton and others who are aviators in the room might have also picked up on the incredible fact that that was an awful pig of a plane to fly. And in fact, once you got in the control, uh, took control, for the next eight or 12 or how many hours, you were there. You couldn't swap seats. <laughs> yes, want, it, it yeah. was a single air, pilot aircraft. So, And, and was it that bad, uh, an aircraft to fly? Apparently it was uh, yes, it, wingspan it, and length and all the ratios were quite awry. Yes, it was all cables and pulleys. There were no hydraulics, no electrics. And it was a very heavy, sluggish aircraft to fly. And uh, like you say, there was absolutely no way that, uh, although it carried two pilots in, in the modified cockpit, there was no way they could have switched seats in flight. So. Right, next. Yes, Tony Higginbottom, flight lieutenant. <laughs> you know that. Uh oh, is this a technical question? <clears throat> uh, uh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to add to the reputation of Ross and Keith Smith, if, if that's possible. Something I learned last night is that the prize, as everyone would know, was £10,000 for the Smith venture from England to Australia. That was a lot of money then, £10,000, if you think about it. It was and close to a million dollars. It was about $780,000. It's close to a million dollars now. And what, what they did, the Smith brothers, they said we will share it between the four of us. They didn't keep it, the two of them. They shared with the two engineers who were with them all the way. They all got 250,000 each, yes. uh, <coughs> which I, I think is, what is it? One quarter of 10,000 each was to each of the four of them. They were not only blazing a trail, but they were generous as well. So we'll take that as a comment. Or a further question? <laughs> <laughs> or, shall, or shall we just go on arguing? <laughs> well, if, if there are no further questions, I think I might have the microphone, do you mind? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's so hard. Can I sit down? No, you can't sit down. You just stand there like a good boy and behave. Just once. But, Rachel, as a guest, it does fall to my um, happy or unhappy lot to 
thank Mike for his address. I must admit, I find myself um, uh, certainly better informed, if not necessarily any the wiser. Um, uh, but he is obviously, amongst his many other accomplishments in the aviation field, has finally learnt to become quite an accomplished speaker. So, Mike, thank you very much for your address. It falls to my lot to present you with a certificate of appreciation. All right, you can all sit down now. <laughs>